Thanks. So we are going to explain how Salesforce is leveraging um, browser fingerprints to protect access to the web application. Uh, before we start, just a quick uh, introduction. Uh, Ping? Sure. Uh, so my name is Ping. Uh, I did my PhD in Management Information Systems. And uh, currently, I'm a, a principal data scientist working on security Einstein team. Very fancy name. Uh, so my focus has always been using machine learning, uh, data mining, and uh, uh, to solve security threat detection problems. So I've been, uh, you know, giving some talks at data science conferences, uh, InfoSec conferences, and uh, this is my second time at uh, AppSec. Um, that is my email. Uh, so if you have questions, and let's uh, uh, keep in touch. Yeah, so I'm Julian. Uh, I was a security researcher for a number of years uh, and then moved to product management. I actually just left Salesforce a week ago. I'm now at uh, Octarine working on security for uh, Kubernetes cluster. And same thing, you can always contact me after, after the talk. So we're going to uh, explain what browser fingerprints, uh, how we can use them to detect uh, session roaming, some of the challenges in gathering these uh, browser fingerprints. And then um, Ping is going to talk about detecting changes in fingerprints, uh, how we run our machine learning models, and finally we'll end with some thoughts about improvements. So when we started the project a couple of years ago, we were trying to find a way to detect session roaming, uh, even from uh, malware that may be running on the same machine as the victim, or even on the same uh, internal network. And browser fingerprints are famously widely used right now by the, tech, by the uh, ad industry to uh, track users across websites. And we were very interested in this notion of um, recognizing the users without having like a cookie or an IP address. Uh, even though we don't actually care about multiple websites, just one website, but this aspect was, uh, was very interesting. And what is called browser fingerprint is actually more than just fingerprint the browser itself. Uh, you can fingerprint uh, the operating system that's uh, running underneath, even when ki what kind of uh, hardware uh, is attached and accessible through your, your web browser. So the session roaming that we were looking for uh, were of two types. So one is credentials being uh, compromised either through a classic phishing attacks or malware, uh, a couple of years ago, again, we had this uh, dire malware that was targeting a couple of websites, including Salesforce, injecting HTML in the browsers and stealing credentials this way. Uh, it could just be a uh, you know, bridge uh, from another website and the, the users is reusing the same credential. Uh, and the second type, which uh, has always been harder for us to, to figure out, is uh, the current session ID being exfiltrated and reused. So an active session being stolen and reused somewhere else. And that could be a malicious browser extension. Um, that could be, unfortunately, what we see a lot at Salesforce is um, administrators that want some kind of automation from a third party. And the way they get the third party to uh, authenticate uh, uh, to Salesforce is by having the administrator send his current session ID to the third party website, third party website logging in as the administrator and doing the automation. Um, so that's horrible, yes. And that's not the way you're supposed to do, to do it. Um, uh, but I guess that's, that's actually a big thing. So again, we wanted to be able to uh, look at this uh, session that could be you know, initiated later on uh, through a, uh, stealing the credential, or could be uh, done at the same time as the user is being uh, logged in. And again, without just relying on the IP address, which might be uh, the same. So again, when we started this, pro this, uh, this, um, this project, we were looking at two ways of detection at a high level. So the first one is looking at a single user session. And we see that we fingerprint kind of the same environment you know, with some changes, but nothing very different. So we have uh, same fingerprint or more or less. And then suddenly, we see a brand new fingerprint, a completely different environment. And that's highly suspicious. So that's looking at just one user. But, uh, also, but then we can also look at many users. Um, you know, we see, again, different users having different fingerprints being kind of, kind of uh, stable uh, through their session. And suddenly, all of these fingerprints 
converge to a new one um, that's completely different from all the fingerprints we've seen before. And that will be a, tag, uh, a mass attack of, again, a lot of credentials being reused, a lot of sessions being stolen at once, but a massive attack um, of uh, Salesforce users. So we went on uh, figuring out uh, what uh, fingerprints we can, uh, we can uh, gather, and we, we, we call them vectors. Uh, we are currently using 19 of them, um, and some of them are you know, very basic, like what uh, browser are you, are you running, what version of the browser, uh, information about the screen, um, information about the time zone. So you can already say, say some of them are browser specific, Others are more hardware, uh, but then you can get into very interesting things like what is the list of fonts that's installed on your um, on your OS, uh, what uh, version of some plugins are you running, and a few of them we had to remove. But Canvas, I'll get into more detail into this one is is very interesting. Um, the media devices. So I was saying that you can you can have access to uh, the hardware that's available through your browser, and it could be like your webcam, your microphone, your headset, and you can get that with this uh, JavaScript API that doesn't require any specific permission. So uh, the first uh, information here is again just using this API, you get uh, a fairly unique ID for each device. Uh, you may have seen the browser prompting you to get uh, extra permission to explicitly give access to a stream, like to your microphone or your camera on your website. Uh, and if you, if you give this permission, you only get like a human, read human, version, um, human readable version of the, of the API. So you really don't need to ask for permission to get a good uh, fingerprint. And then you can check what the browser supports, you know, what uh, codecs it supports, um, web sockets, all this kind of thing. So again, if you look at them one by one, you may see think that there's not much information out of that, but if you combine the 19 of them, uh, you get something uh, fairly unique. And there are two fingerprints that are quite different from each other, and if you look for white paper on fingerprints, you will see a lot of fingerprint based exclusively on Canvas and WebGL. And that's because they give you um, a fingerprint that's specific to your uh, browser, to your OS, to your graphic card, and even to the uh, version of the driver that you're running for this graphic card. And the idea is that uh, all this combination will give you a slightly different way of creating an image. So you create a Canva, you uh, output some, um, some text, um, because a lot of uh, differences are, are in the way you know, uh, the fonts are, are being aliased. So you create this, uh, this text, different background, and then you read the Canva uh, pixel by pixel. And you will get a slightly different result, again, for all of these um, combination of OS, browser, and hardware. And that's an example on my Linux, Linux machine using Firefox on brotherleaks.com, um, and you see that it's, it's saying it's, you know, it's very unique. Uh, and then if you combine that with WebGL and all of the other uh, vectors that you have, you can really get a very accurate picture of the user's uh, environment. So you saw in the, in the list that had a couple of vectors that were, that, uh, were uh, written off. And um, when we are looking at um, fingerprints, we are always looking for something that's very stable. Um, so some things like uh, detecting the way you type varies a lot, whether it's like a, a small uh, number box where you're, you're going to, to do two, um, two touch keys, or whether it's a, a long uh, freeform text, you're going to type very differently, but also most of the time you won't be typing at all. Uh, so that's not a very good stable fingerprint that we can use. Um, the ecosystem has changed a lot. You know, again, we started the project about three, four years ago, and a couple of things have changed. Uh, so browser vendors uh, have done a, some effort. Uh, it's not that much about uh, trying to prevent some of the fingerprinting because it's used by the uh, <coughs> ad industry to, uh, to track, uh, track uh, users, but it's actually as it has not been an issue so far because the, the amount of anonymization that they've done is very minimal. Like they've done some work around um, kind of having a standard list of fonts, for example, uh, that's shown to, um, through the JavaScript API. But if you care about fingerprinting, uh, Tor, the Tor browser has done a lot more work to anonymize some of the data. Um, 
permission changes. So it used to be three, four years ago that you could do anything in the browsers and the browser will never ask for permission. Now, uh, if you want to enable Flash, you know, it's, it, it went from uh, asking the users to not being disabled by default and much harder. So that's why, for example, uh, we are not able to uh, easily get the Flash version from JavaScript anymore because it's most often either disabled completely or uh, it will pop up a permission box in the browser. And talking about plugins, again, three, four years ago, there used to be a lot of, of plugins in the, in the browser run by the user. It used to be things like Flash, uh, probably Adobe Reader to read PDF, um, Silverlight was still there, you know, maybe still Java for applets. Now browsers have you know, probably zero of them being enabled, uh, or maybe one, just Flash, but that's it. So some of the information that we were able to pull a couple of years ago um, is not really useful anymore. And then the last challenge that, that we had is uh, more uh, because of the way we collect fingerprints. So we are doing it trans uh, transparently, kind of in the background as, a, as the user is using the website. So we have to make sure that we don't um, hold up too much time from, uh, from the browser. Otherwise, uh, the page freezes and um, it's very noticeable. So what we do is we do blocks of 10 milliseconds, then we yield, then we spend another 10 milliseconds collecting some other vector, etc. And the big issue was with uh, WebGL, where some of the APIs have a very unpredictable um, duration time. And we, we saw um, some action, again, sometimes taking 2 milliseconds and sometimes taking 100, 200 milliseconds. And 100 milliseconds is actually very visible to the user. It looks like the page is freezing, and sometimes even the, the browser, will, uh, especially Chrome, will, uh, will tell you that uh, the page is not working anymore. So WebGL, again, very interesting because it works the same way as Canvas. You draw something uh, in a WebGL Canva, you read it back. Uh, it, it's very interesting, but because of performances, we had to, um, to remove it. So the way we collect fingerprint, it's mostly on the client side, so uh, through JavaScript. Um, so we get this information from the client side, we send it to the server where we sign uh, the fingerprint, we uh, add some metadata related to the user, and we um, send it back as a cookie. And that's mostly for performance reason. We just don't want to store all this information and keep track of it uh, in the back end. Um, and we do all the processing of this fingerprint uh, offline and, uh, and, and we can uh, asynchronously trigger events or, or responses. And that's what Ping is going to, um, to explain. Cool. Well, thanks, uh, Julian. So Julian did amazing work you know, collecting all this data. Now the question is how do we make good use of the data and uh, primarily to detect the session roaming and session hijacking. And, uh, well, as a data scientist, when I come in and take a look at data, the first question I ask, do I, need, do I trust my hypothesis or do I trust Julian's hypothesis that fingerprints are unique enough that we can use it to uniquely identify uh, a user's environment? So what the data shows is for 98% of users, yes, uh, we can use our set of fingerprint uh, vectors to new, uniquely identify user, but again, there's a, another 22% of users actually, they can um, have the same uh, fingerprint, uh, browser fingerprints. And uh, at the session level, um, again, 77% of the sessions, yes, you're going to see one single fingerprint and uh, the other 23% of the sessions, actually there are uh, legitimate reasons where session, uh, where browser fingerprints are gonna change. Now, how can we reliably, you know, um, work around all these non-uniqueness of session fin uh, browser fingerprints on users or sessions, also uh, still solve the problems of detecting session roaming? Yeah, um, right now, panic mode, we know fingerprinting is going to lead to false positives, and uh, we need to understand how serious those problems are so we know uh, fingerprints may change, uh, you know, by different types of users. So cross-browser testers, developers, they will create big, big nightmare issues. They will be picked up as, you know, session roaming or session hijacking uh, activities. Or uh, just a various of fingerprint components or fingerprint vectors, they have different rate of changes. So you 
yeah, most likely see a OS CPU class being stable versus you know people can, um, you know continu continuously or often resize their window sizes. Um, and uh, over different sessions, you know, uh, we may observe a change in fingerprint and work in some sessions, but not in the other sessions. So, um, how do we address this problem, and how do we uh, make a reliable um, uh, call out? When we see a change, when we see a mismatch, it is actually a malicious or suspicious uh, session roaming activity. Um, okay, let's enter this powerful tool from information theory. So uh, the Shannon's uh, information theory uh, definition of entropy is one of the most important and most useful uh, equation I got out of my information uh, theory class. And I'll be using this equation as simple as it is in so many different applications. So why is it so powerful? As I just mentioned, you know, there are so many different legitimate changes. We're going to observe a change, but how do we capture those dynamics? And uh, this entropy metric uses a single equation, single number that can reliably measure, you know, the randomness or say uh, chaoticness of a system. Um, I use a small graphic to, to kind of illustrate the idea. If in a uh, low entropy system, you're going to see, you know, a state being fairly stable, and the chance you observing an event, um, basically dominance the entire event space. But in a, uh, uh, you know, highly chaos system, shown um, on the uh, right hand side, um, that um, that would uh, produce a much higher entropy. That uh, basically indicate you know, in the system, we are going to observe uh, many, many different states uh, for your events. So what this tells us about our fingerprint changing behavior, basically what it tells us is, if we are seeing a hand, um, if we uh, profile a user's past sessions, you know, say over two weeks or a month, and uh, for all those uh, months, of, months worth of sessions, we are seeing a high entropy. That means this user has been changing their fingerprints fairly frequently, right? And uh, what does that indicate? That user is more likely to be a cross-browser tester or developer, and he has uh, his own legitimate reasons, you know, uh, changing his uh, fingerprint, uh, browser fingerprints. Or, you know, he might just be running a uh, browser anonymizing extension in his browsers. And on the other hand, for a user like me, I do not play with my uh, browsers much. And uh, if uh, you profile my uh, past month sessions, you're going to see a pretty low entropy. My fingerprint uh, change behavior is pretty stable and very low. So we can make use of that information and uh, profile all our user sessions. And whenever we see uh, yeah, actually, let me uh, get into the other component of the detection work. So, Julian talked about um, we log fingerprints at the you know uh, uh, platform and we collected all those data. And we have we also talked about the components where we uh, measure the entropy or we profile a user's session uh, browser changing behavior using entropy. And uh, basically, that will tell us, you know, how likely we're going to observe a change in finger, you know, user's fingerprint. So the second component uh, is the actual uh, uh, extent or uh, significance of the change. Um, so we call it, you know, the fingerprint differing. If you uh, take a closer look at that uh, diagram, we have two sets of fingerprints, and one from Macintosh, the other from Windows PC. So apparently, uh, the blue dots, they cluster together, and the red dots cluster together. And the dis distance between those two sets of fingerprints is larger, right? Um, so um, we simply just calculate the, uh, the change between fingerprint components, and we do it for each individual component. Now, with those two sets of parameters, what we can do is 
given the likelihood of observer change and given uh, the significance or the distance um, of a change, we can um, rank all our sessions by the suspiciousness of you know, observing a change. So it is as simple as a just a weighted sum. And uh, this way, we'll be able to you know, <laughs> get rid of most of the uh, false positives because, because uh, <laughs> um, false positives is data scientist's biggest nightmare. And now just you know, breathe in and uh, stay calm. Um, and not <laughs> oh yeah, please. As, as you see fingerprints coming in and changing over time, Right. As you see fingerprints coming in and changing over time, right. uh, I, I presume you've got a standard benchmark set that you compare against, right? So does that benchmark get updated? Uh, we, yeah, uh, uh, simply put, yes, we have that benchmark uh, updated, but we do it uh, slightly different. So instead of you know uh, keeping us kind of like keeping the states of the past, past, past the benchmark, we basically just uh, profile all the fingerprints of a user over all the sessions you know, in the training phase and uh, generate a single metric to tell how likely we're going to see a change happening in that user's session. Right, Again, so, right? so if you have multiple, I guess you got two different values for uh, the two different extremes you've collected over time, are you, are you just taking the average of it? Or are you, uh, how are you updating? By taking into extremes, you mean like if we, I see a user, you know, having a fingerprint uh, indicating a uh, bank toss versus. Uh, well, well, let's take an example, a really yeah. bad example, but that shows the point. Let's say the window size. We know right, it's a right. bad example, yeah. right? But let's say if we're using the window size, it could be a small window, it could be a big window, yep. and it's going to change over time. So are you like trying to? figure out, oh, this was the minimal size, this was the maximum size, if it's within these values, it's okay. So maybe we'll take an average and, and maybe use some statistical measures of standard deviation or something like that to find out, does it fall within that range? I think that would be a good metric, but that is not how, not how we did it here. But okay. uh, using window size is a, a good example. Right. Does it say, uh, so for that user, we often see this user's window size changing from zero to 700, you know, um, uh -huh. and that happens fairly frequently. Then um, what we do is like, we learn that behavior and we notice like the likelihood of seeing window size changing is very high. So therefore, when we see a change in the window size for that user, we just do not care about it because right. we know so you, that you is expected, that, right? right? And, and what if what if you're doing yeah. something like an IP address, for example? There's no correlation between the past and the new because it's dynamic; it changes. And um, for IP addresses, um, the same thing, right? So, um, if in the user's past sessions, we do see you know two different IPs versus just a one single IP, meaning IP didn't change. Um, two different IPs or three different IPs indicating the IP has changed. So again, all those uh, data will give us the statistical likelihood whether that use, we're going to uh, see a change on that user's IP again. Right, but do you ignore so the IP, for example, if it changes We, we do times? not keep states of those IPs. We do not need to know, you know what IPs have been seen or not. So um, at the detection phase, all we need to do is um, uh, within that session, all the IPs will be compared uh, sequentially uh, in pairs. So always the current IP versus the previous IP. And uh, is, is it a match? And oh, if it is not a match, uh, how much of distance it is? Because you know, if it is a sub change, change, like, um, then it is more significant than you know, just uh, uh, being uh, Two different IPs, but on the same same subnet. So we have a right. distance metric to measure. Mm -hmm. uh, either it's IP or it is uh, canvas or it is uh, time zone of size. So, right. yeah, uh, I hope I answered your questions. Right. But, uh, uh, the the question is if a bad factor if is a bad operator comes in and that's, they've got different stuff. How do you measure that, and how do you ignore that? Are you looking for completely different fingerprint? 
Uh, yeah, so we generally the bad actors we um, um, we expect to see a pretty large uh, um, fingerprint change. So meaning, um, so at the end of the day, when we rank all those different sessions, we rank it by uh, the central roaming score, and each of the score indicates, you know, uh, how big a change, uh, how big of change it was, and also uh, compared to their. Uh, the, uh, well, the, the change is going to be compared to the uh, past behavior that we learned from the legitimate user. Right. So the attacker comes in and it, he behaves, you know, rather different from right. the legitimate So user. using those, just my last question, I'm sorry for dominating. Uh, oh, what was the, what's mm -hmm. the percentage of positive, uh, false positives and what's the percentage of false negatives that you found in your research? Yeah, that is a very good question. So uh, we've been doing the analysis with our security partners, basically, you know, our uh, security expertise who can tell us, okay, whenever we pick up something, uh, they tell us this is truly malicious versus this is, you know, a, another false positive. Um, and uh, as of now, uh, our rate stays at around, you know, 50-50. 50-50? Yeah, meaning uh, Flip a coin. among, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but of course, we're only feeding our uh, security analyst a very small set of things. So imagine we have like hundreds of millions of sessions and uh, the ones ranked to the top by our detection model is going to be in the set of 10 or 20 a day. So we already ruled out all the uh, false positive scenarios like, you know, that hundreds of million minus 10 or 20. And uh, among those 10 or 20 detections, you know, analyzed by uh, uh, our analysts, uh, we are seeing, you know, 50% being truly suspicious concerned session, uh, concerning sessions versus 50%, uh, 50% well, they, they are definitely suspicious, but it's not malicious. It's not, you know, attacker <laughs> acting. Right. So, so, so you you let him in. But of the ones you say this is this this is a bad guy, we're not going to let him in. In in those cases, how many of them are you right? Or how many of the bad guys do you let in? Uh, that is the fifty percent I'm talking That's about. The 50%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thanks for. Uh, those are great questions. Last slide. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so some, <laughs> some, of, I, some of these to uh, kind of improve. Um, so one is we're always looking at more information, more, more data. Um, so one of the things we wanted to add is J3, which uh, is an open source project from Salesforce, which allows you to fingerprint the uh, SSL connection from the clients. And that can uh, identify, again, the combination of browser and, um, and OS that you are running. Uh, we would like, obviously, to uh, bring back WebGL because it's so powerful. Uh, and talking about JS3, JS3 is actually um, fingerprinting the SSL is something that's very hard to, um, to fake. So we would like to be able to correlate you know, information from the client side that can be faked and modified, um, information from the server side and JS3 to um, make sure that we have fingerprints that look legitimate. Um, and the biggest thing to, to get back to your question about false positive um, is um, we, we are not using it as a single signal to make an action. Uh, mm -hmm. We have other signals and then we can do things that are less intrusive like uh, triggering 2FA for example. Uh, we also have this notion of you know, sensitive action like if you're downloading a report, um, that's where we can combine it and ask for 2FA or do, do something else. And finally, probably the biggest thing that we, we need to work on is what do we do when no fingerprints are being generated? So I mentioned that fingerprints are collected and initiated from the client side. So if you don't see any data being collected or sent, that's either because JavaScript is not running in the browser, and that's likely not the users because you cannot really use um, Salesforce without JavaScript, or uh, something in the browser is actively preventing these fingerprints to be either collected or, or sent. And that's, again, something, um, something suspicious. Thanks. Uh, if I you have, have any question. questions. Yes? So um, what is the project name? Which uh, Have you guys open sourced this? 
so the open source project I was talking about is uh, JS3. Uh, exactly. We haven't, um, there's not much to really open source on the fingerprint side. Uh, if you go to website like browserleaks.com or pentoclick.com, um, you can actually, they are open source that you know, show you how to collect information. And uh, on the backend side, the um, processing of the fingerprints is really tied to the way we process logs um, uh, at Salesforce, and it's hard to just isolate. Um, uh, and uh, did you guys use this particular methodology, uh, like the software what you wrote and the met methodology, uh, on a particular website or a combination of websites? So Salesforce has a lot of websites. Uh, we've been using it on the CRM part, which is the biggest web application at, uh, at Salesforce. Uh -huh. Please. So, we're using device fingerprinting not. To, we're using device fingerprinting, or trying to not to like, um, not to track sessions, but basically to, to, to stop people from creating new accounts, to stop kind of fraudsters. And do you have any experience like trying to hide that like the signing key from like fraudsters in like JavaScript, some kind of obfuscation or anything like that? Like, have you thought to hide the key so you can kind of like do do like verify the you know, validity of? So, the so it's not signed on the front end; it's signed in the back end, right? Because the the I mean. It's just a way of, because we are relying on the user sending back the previous, um, the previous fingerprint, and again, that's just for performance issues, so we don't, have to, we don't want to track it on the back end. So every time they send a new fingerprint, they also send the last one, which we store in the cookie. So that's why we are signing it on the server side only, just to make sure that um, they are not faking the, 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 the cookie, the, the previous cookie. Uh, so we're not signing anything on the client side. Okay, thanks. I'm, uh, I'm curious, so it sounds like you guys are using uh, sort of an open source or sort of kind of built your own sort of device fingerprinting, browser fingerprinting. There are vendors in this market space, Ivation, um, Threat Metrics, things like that. I'm just curious, is there a reason why you guys built this in-house? Is it cost? Is it um, some, there's more control that you guys have? I'm, I'm kind of curious. Yeah, in general, it's, it's cost and integration cost as well uh, and scale. Uh, we want to be able to, um, to have all the control that we need, and um, and we do have all the talents you know, from data science to developers in house. So most of the, I think all of the security measures that are baked in the application are all from Salesforce. Uh, we have vendors more on the like detection and response side. That's where we use a lot of vendors. But pretty much anything that's going to be included in the application uh, is is in house. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> um, users on multiple devices, are they part of your 28% that you can't really fingerprint well, or do you have a concept of like multiple fingerprints per user? Yeah, that, that is the 20% we're observing. So basically, uh, multiple fingerprints per user, uh, also uh, uh, same user, uh, same fingerprint, multiple users. Yeah, and so, we have a lot yeah. of company that share the same account, which is not supposed to do, but we're not doing anything, so uh, that doesn't help either. I think that's part of this uh, 20%. Uh, the gentleman over there had mentioned there are other vendors that are doing this, and, and I happen to know that some of the stuff is, is highly protected with intellectual property and patents. Have you looked into any of the patent side of things so that when you do stuff like this, uh, is, it, is it already patented or is this, you know, Breakthrough. That um, no, we haven't looked into it. And again, there's a lot of open source, you know, Pentoclick and, uh, and, and white papers that, uh, academic white papers that explain um, how these fingerprints are generated. That, that's, a, that's a pretty old technology. I think it's just a new spin on how to use it. I mean, the other, other industries have been using it for years. Um, and uh, that's kind of the opposite. We're not you know, using it to invade privacy, but either to make your. Um, your session more, or your account more secure, and, and um, yeah, the just different take. If I can add to that, um, yeah, I didn't look into that either, but we did file a patent on this because that is requirement for us to uh, publicly speak this. And uh, I think the lawyers, uh, yeah, are required to do some prior research to make sure whatever we are 
discussing here is not already patented. So I cannot give you a positive answer or negative answer, but I think we we had a lawyer stand up on the work. Uh, yeah. Okay, I had a question. Can you, um, this seems like a perfect case for machine learning type thing. Do you guys use machine learning like TensorFlow or artificial intelligence type work? Uh, we didn't strictly use a uh, class, uh, machine learning technique like classification because uh, this is not strictly a uh, classification or uh, learning problem. But um, the way we calculate for the anomaly score or whatever, uh, that is based on uh, you know uh, learning from the user's past behavior sort of profile profiling. Um, we have machine learning uh, um, models in other um, applications. Uh, however, the biggest uh, challenge of using machine learning models is uh, unlike image data or audio data, there are plenty of you know labeled data sets around, but for these, there's no labels to work with, right? So you cannot just directly upload your data set to TensorFlow and expect TensorFlow to apply all those, you know, dozens of machine learning uh, models on it and discover things. So, um, yeah, um, that is, yeah, that is something we definitely uh, explored. It's just, uh, yeah, we were not able to find a good fit. Have you um, <clears throat> detected anyone attempting to fake the data coming from the client side? I think I think in the data there are all sorts of weirdness, and uh, I don't think we. Uh, so we haven't looked too uh, too deep into it, but we were, when we were doing some analysis of what kind of data that we are receiving, yes, we yeah. are definitely you no know, seeing some data that doesn't make too much sense, like huge window size, better than any monitor you can buy out there. Um, uh, yes, that's yes. Maybe it's, it's very possible. Maybe you could um, weight each fingerprint, uh, taking into account that data coming from the client side may be untrustworthy, whereas things like JA3 and server side data is. Yeah, less right now, pretty much everything is on the client side, um, and um, it's. The downside is you know, for this specific user, we're not able to protect them. But because, again, we're looking at individual users mostly, it doesn't really matter if you know, some of users are, are doing this. Right? We're not trying to figure out exactly what they're running. We're you know, trying to figure, uh, figure changes. And uh, but, the I mean, if, if I had knowledge of what the original person's setup was, if I was able to capture that somehow, I could fake it to look the same, right? Yes. That's true. Uh, please, uh, this gentleman has been <laughs> trying to ask a question for. Nothing but patient. Um, <laughs> so, to what extent do like GDPR and other PII obligations have on your research and to industry acceptance of browser fingerprinting? Yeah. Yes. I, so, sorry. <laughs> please go ahead. Also, so, like, we, so we, we are we not are actually storing <laughs> like your your actual window size, for example. We are mapping it on the client side to to a value, so we cannot easily revert back and, 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 and say exactly what browser you are running. Also, we are, I was mentioning, we are not storing it, right? That's what everything is on the client side. Um, so we really work on fingerprints, uh, not necessarily on, you know, not on the original value. Cool. Thank you. So, but then how do you make a decision that if you are storing a data, like say so traditionally I come on a Safari browser, and one finally I come on a Firefox, uh, unless you have the historical data, how do you see that this is a uh, division from the pattern? So for, for that, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of a, of a hash, right? So yes, we know. You could just sit and, and wait long enough and get all the possible values. Um, but not always exactly the same value. Like for, for browsers, it's just a few of them. So you know, yes, you could say, can't tell exactly if it's Firefox or, or Chrome. But for other like window size, uh, we store it on a lower number of bytes. So the same byte might give you like a range. Um, of uh, of size, um, you know. If you look at the canvas again, it's this time there's just no way to get back to what uh, you know original hardware uh, may have done that. Uh, so a lot of them uh, again, it's it's not possible to get back exactly to the original value. Uh, some are binary, so yes, whether you support WebSocket or not is you know one or zero, so it's easy to come back. So I had a couple of questions for you. Um, 
The first one is, are, are you interacting on both the Git request and the post body response? And um, based on that, are you targeting the fingerprinting on sensitive URIs or are you doing this global? And what I mean by that is this all URLs and URI combinations or are you basically saying this is a sensitive login URI, this is a sensitive you know, password reset URI, focus on those, ignore everything else? So we do it at intervals, like every 10 minutes, regardless on where you are on the page. So it's not targeted to a specific uh, section of the website. And are you interacting, are you looking at just the get request or are you actually interacting with the, the post body as well? So, I mean, we're, we're not looking at the, at the requests that are being sent. Uh, we're, you know, just gathering information mostly from the JavaScript side uh, and not, we are not looking at like a pattern of activity. Do we have any more questions? There are. <laughs> I'm not sure if I understood it right, but if you are storing all the data in hash format, then delta of the data, or in other words, delta of the hash would not represent same as delta of the original data, right? Yes, it will be a little bit smaller. So if you go from like a window side of 800 to 600 by to you know, 802 by 610, it might be the same hash, but at the same time, that's not a significant change either, right? Because again, we are looking, we're only interested in, in changes. And um, I understand, but so, so for example, if I change my resolution from 768 to 769, the hash is going to be completely different, right? Um, the, 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 so the hash is not on all the value. We have like a hash for each vector. So yes, for this vector, it might or might not be again because of the uh, entropy and the size, uh, but it won't change the entire uh, score. Yes, so we, we call it a hash, but it's actually uh, a concatenation of smaller hashes that are independent from each other. All right, thank you. Do we have more questions? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.